Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining the Florida Food Policy Council's monthly Florida Food Forum hosted by the Policy Committee of the Florida Food Council. I am Del Deschant, the committee leader and host of the forum. Welcome to all for joining via cyber systems or phone lines. With us from the council is the council's administrator, Kendra Love. Kendra will be handling the technical and managerial aspects of our meeting. Kendra, do you have anything to share right now for the folks that are calling in? Uh, yes, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we are using the Microsoft Teams system, so it's a little bit unique in that it is more interactive. Um, so we do ask that you please keep your cameras off and your microphones muted. At the bottom of your screen, if you're joining us online, there's a, a little box where you can enter in any questions you have. If you do have a question while the presentation is going on, and we will get to those during the Q&A session. If you are joining us by phone, to unmute yourself during the Q&A, you can push star six to unmute yourselves. Thanks, Kendra. This month's forum engages a topic that is at once fairly well known to most folks involved in contemporary foodways, namely technology, a subject that is at once a source of enormous promise, but also a source that may have potential perils. It seems that every aspect of the food system is of heightened significance today due to the radical disruptions we're experiencing in culture as a whole and agriculture in particular. Government, the economy, healthcare, education, and social cohesion evince signs of stress, if not fracture. And certainly the food system does as well. And so in this context, the Florida Food Forum is pleased to offer technology in the food production system featuring Ricky Stevens. Thanks as always for joining us. A document introducing our presenter for today is posted on the council's blog site. And if you registered for the event, you have seen the introduction. If not, you can check it out now or at the site later. Today, we're pleased to welcome Ricky Stevens to leadership of our forum. Ricky comes to us with deep experience and professional expertise in agricultural technology. He is the Director of Digital Strategy at Agritecture Consulting, which is an international firm focusing on urban agricultural planning services. He has developed programming for various urban agricultural conferences, plays a major role in the New York City Agriculture Collective, and founded AgTech, X, New York's first incubator for agricultural technology and entrepreneurship. We are honored to have him with us. Following Ricky's opening 20 minute presentation will be an opportunity for questions and discussion. Before going further, let me invite everyone here today, or perhaps tuning in at a later date, to please consider joining the Florida Food Policy Council. You'll find information about membership on our website. The Florida Food Policy Council is a unique organization within the state, and it's the one source that brings you the Florida Food Forum and an opportunity to participate in leadership in Florida food systems. And as I turn things over to Ricky, I ask that he tell us about himself and what inspired him to pursue a career in agriculture technology noting that his bachelor's degree from Davidson was in history. So with pleasure, we welcome Ricky Stevens. Ricky? Great. Thanks so much, Del, for that intro. Um, thanks, Kendra, for setting all of this up. And hello to everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, this is a huge topic. I'll get to my background in a second, Del. Um, technology in the food production system, uh, you know, first of all, you could take, obviously, an entire uh, seminar on this topic and, and spend uh, your whole career studying it. Um, as you heard from my intro, my focus is mainly in urban agriculture. So I'm going to sort of touch briefly on um, 
technology in the wider food production space, and then I'll kind of funnel down into urban agriculture in particular. Um, let me take a step back uh, for, for just my background. Yeah, so I, I went to Davidson College, tiny liberal arts school. Um, I studied history there. Uh, I then went and worked for a data analytics company called Red Ventures in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, that eventually took me to Sao Paulo, Brazil, where I helped them set up a, an office for about a year and a half down there. And you know, my passion has always been in and around food. Um, and, and being down there, I think, really allowed me an opportunity to take a step back and really look at the trajectory that I was on with my career and um, evaluate some of my passions. So it was a, uh, it was really an opportunity to clear my my head. And um, and and as I started getting deeper into uh, what really drove me around food, um, and it became clearer and clearer that that was also linked to environmental sustainability and human health. You get to a point, and someone even warned me about this in one of my first conversations that I had as I was at, trying to enter this space and make new contacts. Was you get to a point of no return, right? Where you you understand enough where you feel responsible and that you need to take action. And so that's um, that's really what happened to me. I, I moved back from Brazil. I left that, that job, um, moved back to New York where I'm from originally. And I've been here for the last four years, really just diving into um, the, the world of sustainable agriculture. I pretty quickly found a, a home within the urban ag um, community, but realized this, this gap um, for early stage uh, learners, students, entrepreneurs, um, where they, they really couldn't find access to resources. Um, so that launched AgTechX. Um, AgTechX got me connected into the Agritecture consulting team. Um, and so uh, a year ago, two years into to launching AgTechX, uh, we were acquired by Agritecture. So I'm now full-time with Agritecture. And I'll touch a little bit at the very end if there's time just on what we do. All right. So big picture, high level, and again, this is not my, my expertise in 20th century agriculture, but um, I wanted to start here just looking at the significant technology advancements um, of last century. And um, obviously you can read much more about this. I don't wanna waste your time since I'm, I'm not an expert here, but you know what you saw is that a lot of it was around um, creating caloric dense foods um, increasing productivity. There were, you know, perhaps very reasonable um, arguments to do that. We needed to feed this growing population. Um, we didn't necessarily have such advanced technology to be able to do so up until that point. Um, so things like uh, tractors and uh, advancements in, in crop breeding and genetics, um, chemical pesticides and herbicides, um, nitrogen fixation, um, all of these things became crucial, but they also got us stuck in um, the, the system that we're, we're now in. Um, and the, the two things that really led to, you know, as we got into the 21st century, we saw um, a, a mass increase in commodity crop production, um, a homogeneity to um, food production in general, um, and also huge consolidation of American farming. Um, so, you know, kind of the loss of the, the family farmer or the medium um, scale farmer even. Um, and so we'll, let's talk about some specific pr problems that this has now led us to. Um, just some stats here. Uh, fresh water use agriculture is the leading driver of fresh water use around 70 percent um, in some parts of the world, 80 percent. Um, and, you know, here in the U.S., we have kind of this this crazy system where um, especially when it comes to things like leafy greens, for example, we produce 98% um, of all of our leafy greens in California and Southern California and Arizona, um, where you know there's uh, extreme proneness to drought. Um, and then we import that produce for me here in New York, 3,000 miles to, to consumers here. So, um, and you're talking about a, a product that is 90 plus percent water, you know. So at the end of the day, you're you're essentially uh, taking water from areas where there's where we're running out of it um, and, and transporting it 3,000 miles or more. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, again, you can dive really deep into this topic, but um, food, food production or the food system in general 
there's different ranges, but generally what you see is it, it's responsible for somewhere between 25 and 33% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Now, a lot of that is linked to animal agriculture, um, but for example, the process through which we create nitrogen fertilizer is also a significant source of that. Um, and then obviously food waste is a huge issue. Um, so, you know, about a third of all food that we produce um, is never consumed. And when it comes to highly perishable items, um, such as fruits and vegetables, the estimates are closer to 50%. Um, what else? You know, there's the argument of, uh, you know, the system we're in is because uh, uh, we needed to, to increase food security. And yet, here in the U.S., um, one in eight Americans still experienced food insecurity in 2018. Um, in Florida, that translates to 2.8 million residents. Um, so, you know, that argument doesn't necessarily um, it doesn't necessarily stand. Um, and then labor is a huge issue. This is something I've been continuing to learn about. Um, you hear this stat a lot. Um, the average age of farmers has been climbing for the last 30 years. Um, it's not just the U.S. problem, by the way. Um, in other parts of the world, it's even higher than, than 59, which is the average here in the U.S. Um, and so, you know, we need to find a way to, to get young people into agriculture. But there's other labor issues as well. A 2012 report showed that 20% um, of U.S. produce lost, getting back to that food waste stat, um, on the farm is due specifically to labor shortages. Um, there was a really interesting report uh, last year that, that RBC, Royal Bank of Canada, put out that estimated that Canada, Canada will have a labor shortage of 120,000 skilled um, workers by 2030. Um, and then at the bottom here, you can just see some numbers um, you know, we rely heavily on immigrants in the U.S. Um, for our agriculture labor force. And obviously, um, you know, I'm not going to get into the, the, the politics of that situation, but um, because of the stalemate we've been in, um, you know, there, that poses serious, serious threats as to who is actually going to grow and harvest our food. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention just the, the inequities and the systemic racism that has also plagued the food system. Um, and, and um, you know, you can see this in different ways, uh, just from a, a inequality standpoint, since 1995, the top 10% of farmers have received 75% of all crop subsidies. Um, looking at these recent farm bailouts uh, over the last year or so, the top 10% of farmers received 54% of all of that money. And then this chart is just, it's, it's mind boggling and, and horribly unjust, but um, this is a chart from from the counter, which was formerly a new food economy. Um, they have a great piece looking at discrimination um, specifically within the USDA um, and their lending practices. Um, but you can see that that, yeah, the effect of of discrimination and systemic injustice and racism led to the number of black farmers falling ninety eight percent from nineteen twenty to nineteen ninety seven. Um, extremely tragic. So let's move into now, like trying to understand the, the current ag tech landscape. Um, and I'll circle back to, you know, let, let's keep the, these, these problems that, that we have right now in mind um, as we move forward into potential solutions. Um, so the next two slides are some charts from Ag Funder News. Um, definitely download the report if you're interested in diving deeper into the numbers. You can find it at agfunder.com. Um, Ag Funder News, by the way, just a great source of information in general um, for, for, for news and content related to ag tech, the ag tech startup and investment space. They've done a great job of trying to categorize where a lot of this innovation is happening um, and fostering a lot of that innovation themselves through some investment. Um, so here's just, you can see that the overall categories um, looking then, I believe this is last year, yeah, 2019, um, at the total funding numbers. So the interesting thing here is that in 2013, when AgFunder first started looking at these numbers, the total investment um, space for all of like agri-food tech was, uh, was about half a billion dollars. By last year, it had hit almost $20 billion, so a 40X increase in six years. So this space is overall, it's booming. Um, but as you can see from this last slide, you know, a lot of different categories that that make up that landscape. Um, 
the the yellow, by the way, is what they call kind of upstream. So that's more the true ag tech, um, actual food, food production um, space, whereas the the blue is more downstream, so kind of supply chain and uh, and consumption. Just looking here, just giving you a scale for for um, the different niches within the ag tech um, ecosystem in particular. Uh, one of the really booming um, parts of all of this right now is is ag biotechnology. So um, trying to replace a lot of those uh, you know synthetic um, pesticides, herbicides with um, with bio pesticides, things that can still um, allow for biodiversity on farms, can allow for organic practices. You're seeing that space um, definitely booming. A lot going on there. Novel farming systems is what I'll refer to mainly as commercial urban farming. There's a lot of different names for that, um, but this is mainly focused on the, um, the new forms of controlled environment agriculture. It doesn't just focus on uh, plants and uh, things like that. It's also insects, aquaculture, um, things that are starting to move into more um, automated and controlled environments, um, environments or, or systems. Um, so just quickly, there, there's different drivers for why this is happening, right? Getting back to the, the problems, you're seeing definitely a heightened consumer awareness overall. Um, and so you're seeing that shift towards consumer behavior, um, diet shifts, um, moving more towards plant-based diets, um, heightened consumer demand for local and sustainable products. Um, and, and, and we're continuing to see this growing body of research connecting conventional farming methods to negative environmental and human health effects. Now, this doesn't always match what the major drivers are from an investor mindset. Um, you know, when you look at Ag Funder, I'll get into this in a couple of slides, but you know, I'm really talking about kind of more of the conventional startup and investment ecosystem, largely driven by venture capital. I'll talk a lot about some, some alternative investment um, strategies as well. But when you look at drivers from an investor mindset, you know, oftentimes it's much more high level indicators um, so one that you you heard a lot, um, especially around 2015, was that agriculture makes up about 10% of the world's GDP, but only 3.5% of the total VC investment. Though that, that percent has probably grown a little bit, but is still um, low relative to agriculture's total uh, market size. Um, so that was pointing a lot of you know maybe typical technology investors into the agriculture space to say, wow, there's a huge gap here. Um, and, and there's definitely, you know, productivity gains as well. Number three, efficiency gains, which which can mean more profit, um, which obviously translates back to higher returns for those investors. And then, you know, dietary shifts are definitely on their minds as well. Um, I think a lot of investors see the opportunity, especially for early movers. The first mover to get their product to market can have a huge advantage when it comes to um, uh, an eventual acquisition or to huge growth uh, rates that that especially venture capital investors would like to see. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about urban agriculture drivers. This uh, chart, I'm not going to get into all of this, but um, I used to teach a class at AgTechX, taught about 50 or 60 times. And this chart really comes from the question I would ask at the beginning of that course, um, which was, you know, why do you think urban agriculture is happening? And I eventually found there were kind of six main categories that people would, would mention. Um, but they would always mention the trends, right? Um, oh, there's the rising demand for fresh or local, organic or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's there's rising inequality, um, which which creates uh, constraints for for certain urban neighborhoods. Um, so they, you know, it was it was oftentimes focused on, you know, what is that that cause? Um, what I often would then advise to entrepreneurs that would walk in our door is. You know, don't focus on the trend if you're trying to create a solution. Focus first on what drives you. Um, and by the way, you're not going to be able to, to create a solution that solves every single one, um, at least early on. So focus on the things that really drive you. So if that is solving market gaps, if that is educating the next generation, um, you can then find your solution through the, the opportunity that exists um, in the market. Um, so just one helpful exercise that I wanted to, to mention here. I want to move into, into startup financing um, and an alternative investment um, opportunities. So I think one thing that 
is, um, and Dell kind of mentioned this at the beginning, right? This this dilemma of new technology can certainly bring, um, it can certainly address some of these uh, these these problems when it comes to sustainability um, and other major issues that that have presented us because of the the kind of conventional um, food system that we're we're now in. Um, but at the same time, that 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 conventional venture capital financing approach can perpetuate the status quo. And I think this chart from another ag funder report actually, which is uh, was released last year with idea to scale, it's called the Food and Ag Tech Investor Sentiment Report. You can also download that for free on their website. Um, I think this graph really shows that. Um, they asked investors, what's your most valuable source of deal flow? Warm intros was by far and away the largest source. What that means is if you are new to the technology startup world, you aren't going to be able to get a warm intro like somebody that has two exits under their belt and is connected to dozens of investors and can go out and raise a million dollars just based on their resume alone. So in that sense, you know, one of my concerns is that um, you know, we're, we're seeing these numbers, we're reading about a lot of this hype around companies raising 30, $100 million rounds. Um, and, and there's mixed feelings there because I think I think the people that are, are getting that money, um, it can definitely be, be people that are just continuing to kind of perpetuate the status quo, especially when it comes to just the inequalities of the food system. They might be addressing um, certain um, uh, challenges when it comes to sustainability, such as, as wa uh, fresh water use, um, for example, but um, are they also addressing some of these other, um, you know, very scary issues that we have in front of us. So, you know, one of the things we used to really advise our entrepreneurs on at AgTechX, who were by and large very impact driven, was look, there is a whole world of alternative financing that's out there. It gets less attention, but there can be the potential for higher impact. So, here's just a list of a couple. Um, we actually, the AgTechX website is still live. And so you can actually find we open sourced a list of um, alternative financing vehicles that were most pertinent to kind of the New York area, but some US in general. Um, and, and it's a mixture of, of public and private grants, um, CDFIs, community development funds. Um, in the non-extractive lending space, there's a lot of, um, of interesting models within that. Um, one company that I think is really interesting that we've been talking to a, a bit is called Mainvest. Um, so they have kind of a a revenue share type model to their lending. Um, so essentially the, the investors won't get paid back until that company starts actually generating positive cash flow and can really stand on their own two feet. Um, there's crowdfunding. So, you know, platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, but now in the last um, five years, actually because of a, an act passed under Ob the Obama administration, there's also equity crowdfunding, which allows um, for uh, non-accredited investors to invest in in private um, early stage companies. Um, a lot of accelerators in the space has have moved. You know, initially they would kind of exchange equity for um, for like a three month program that would train the entrepreneurs on how to build product, how to scale your company fast. Um, a lot of those accelerators have now started moving into non dilutive models, meaning that they don't take equity anymore. Um, so a lot of times they'll their model will be dependent on, on getting uh, funds from um, maybe a, a corporate company that's just interested in um, having an early access to some of the innovation um, that's coming out of those early stage companies. Um, and then impact investment, this is a big category. I, I said some more than others, meaning that, you know, you'll find some impact investors who are truly trying to move the needle on, on more than just um, seeing a return. You'll see other impact investors who I would say have a uh, an investment thesis that is, um, for example, um, uh, you know, the, the, the agriculture system cannot continue to depend on the amount of fresh water that it's currently using. And, and so therefore, um, we are going to invest strictly in technologies that like drip irrigation that decrease that use of water. But we're still going to look for 10x or 20x returns in every company we evaluate. I want to spotlight quickly just two entrepreneurs that I've met in, in my journey recently that I think um, encapsulate 
kind of this this real impact mindset. Um, one is Sashti Balasarandam, um, based in New York. He's a certified master composter. Um, and uh, a number of years ago, as he was um, going through that program and, and doing a lot of community composting, he realized that a lot of uh, small scale composting, um, community gardens, for example, um, the small scale uh, composters lacked um, just the ability to ensure that their compost was, that they were using safe and efficient practices. Um, at the same time, there was actually a, a law that was proposed in New York State that said that you had to show documentation that your compost pile reached the necessary, I think it's 132 degrees Fahrenheit for at least seven days to ensure that it um, uh, that pathogens couldn't survive um, or, or the most harmful pathogens could not survive. So he created a simple IoT device, Internet of Things device that could monitor um, the temperature, um, could make sure that the, the composters were adhering to kind of best practices and then would automatically document that. So people could move away from paper documentation and that way if um, some sort of, of official regulator showed up, um, they could have all of their data um, already stored there. Um, so really interesting example, I think. Um, of, of someone that has uh, has you know seen the opportunity that exists um, and created a very simple solution um, um, within a very impactful space. Um, another one, Colin Numoff. Um, she's actually somebody that I, I interviewed recently. Um, the interviews on our YouTube, YouTube.com/agritecture, or you can find it on our digital conference page on our website. Um, she's the the co-founder of a company called Farm Fair. Um, which is basically a software com a company that links food hubs with um, small regional producers and then shares a lot of the data so that food hubs can better understand um, how to model uh, uh, supply and producers can understand how to better, better model and prepare for demand um, from a consumer standpoint. She's also a huge advocate for something called steward ownership, which I've, I've learned a lot about. Um, Frankly, if you, if, yeah, just for the sake of time, I guess, if you Google it, you'll, you'll be able to learn more than if I tell you about it in the next few minutes. Um, but uh, a really interesting example of someone taking a high impact approach to um, a technology company in the space. Okay, let's do a quick time check. Um, I might have two or three more minutes, so I'm gonna kind of burn through this. I wanted to spotlight in particular a couple um, areas of agriculture um, in terms of just why they matter, um, where, uh, especially um, within the urban farming landscape. So agritecture, you know, by and large, we focus mainly on the CEA space, the, com the um, uh, controlled environment agriculture space. Um, what we're seeing here, I've covered some of this uh, in terms of why it matters. Um, land and water use is a huge issue uh, right now in terms of, of um, food production. Um, there's some other really interesting reasons. Um, Year-round growing, for example, I covered the labor issue. Um, you know, when you have year-round growing, it means that you can actually hire your growers year-round and employ them um, for the entire year. So it breaks kind of that cycle um, of being dependent on um, on seasonal labor um, and creates, you know, steady, long-lasting jobs. You're also seeing a lot of excitement from younger generations, so it directly addresses that average age of a farmer um, challenge that we're seeing. There's a lot of opportunities here for new technology. Lighting efficiency is a huge one for farms that are using um, uh, lighting, uh, fully indoor farms. Um, also, greenhouses that are using um, supplemental lighting during winter months. Um, automation, there's a lot of interesting automation technologies coming off here to offset the high labor costs on indoor farms. Um, and then crop breeding for indoor environments is something that has, has not even really taken off yet, but is something that a lot of experts point to um, could be a big game changer for the CEA space. Um, I'm going to skip over just in the interest of time, small scale urban farming. Um, I can come back to this in the Q&A if people have questions, but um, you know, certainly something that matters. Sashti, great example of someone who's using technology to address um, a challenge here for, for small scale urban farming, um, which is often that they, they lack the budget to invest in really expensive um, technologies. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot here. There's definitely policy that's needed here to protect community gardens, for example. Um, 
and uh, and and ways of of giving these these small scale urban farms and gardens access to processing facilities, for example, so that they can earn revenue on the products that they grow. Um, so a lot to get into here. Regenerative agriculture we haven't really even really addressed yet, but um, you know here I'm talking about using. Uh, more sustainable practices where you're actually able to sequester carbon instead of emitting carbon um, using practices like holistic grazing of animals, um, no-till or low-till um, uh, rotational um, uh, 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 planting. Um, and, and so huge, huge advantages here as well and huge opportunities um, from a data collection standpoint to, to help quantify the benefits a bit more, um, proving that these farms can um, still be profitable at scale um, and, and can be scaled up. And then there's a lot of opportunities in the supply chain and, and on the kind of the marketing and consumer front for regenerative products. Um, I'll just fly through this in 30 seconds and then we can get into the Q&A. So yeah, what we do at Agritecture, we're a small company, um, but we, we work globally on mainly controlled environment um, agriculture projects, but we've also worked on some some hybrid systems. We've done um, some education, uh, some events as well. We worked with the city of Atlanta for a number of years to do a conference down there and really activate a lot of the um, the leadership that they were showing on urban agriculture. Um, education, we've done a number of workshops for a ton of different organizations. We've developed some training and curriculum development um, as well um, for companies and, and organizations, including Square Roots there at the top right. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just end here with with resources and then we can get into the Q&A. Just a list here of resources, some free, some low cost um, uh, that are all on our website. Um, so check those out. And with that, hey, I will. Well, that's great. Uh, Ricky, tremendous presentation, uh, data rich and yet fully engaged, uh, wonderfully done. And I thank you on behalf of the of the forum. Uh, what we want to do now is uh, go ahead and open it up to questions. We have a lot of folks that are watching right now, a lot of folks that have called in. So I think we can open that up. Kendra, if you want to field any of the questions that may have come in in writing, we can do that, or we can just open up the mics. So Kendra, I'm going to let you uh, handle uh, uh, our contacts and the questions that we may have. Well, first, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we, we did ask uh, you to keep yourselves muted during the presentation. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, at this time, you are welcome to unmute yourselves to ask questions uh, for Ricky. If you are on the phone to unmute yourself, you can push the star and number six. If you're on your computer, um, you can just click the, the little microphone button at the bottom and that will unmute you. Um, and if you would like to just submit a question, you can type it into our chat box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, thank you, Kendra. So let's uh, let's open it up to any questions that we may have uh, from our live audience. Hi, my name is Michael. Hi, Michael. Uh, we can hear you, Michael. Go ahead. My question, I guess, is that uh, Michael, you're a little faint. I don't know if that's just me, right. but. Is this better now? Can I get closer? That's a little better, yeah. Sorry about that. I'll try to speak clearly. How's that? There we go. Okay, good. I'll... So, uh, my question was, you, you, you know, you know, we did the financing using a uh, revenue share. It, it was the uh, 504, you know, SEC series. And uh, we did that with local uh, investors because we wanted, you know, more commitment, both ends. We felt we'd be responsible to them because we knew who they were and uh, that they would put a plaque up in their, you know, business or wherever they were and expose us and share us on. Uh, that worked uh, to a certain extent, but our biggest issue was finding the buyers. And is it, you mentioned something toward the end about some way of guaranteeing uh, the purchase of the food. Uh, we ended up giving away about 80% of our food to the you know, food pantries and uh, homeless shelter. Uh, it was supposed to be the other way around. We were going give to give away 20% and sell 80%. Uh, we just couldn't find the buyers. And I feel the same way today. As much as the trends show 
the interest, uh, the commitment to coming out to a local, you know, farm, even even if there's thousands of people within walking distance uh, in South Florida, at least, is uh, a challenge. So, if you could explain a little bit more about how there'd be some security and having to be purchased or do you be no. no. Great question, Michael. Can I ask you what what were you growing? We grew seasonal crops in South Florida. So uh, during the winter, we grew what most people in the United States are familiar with: tomatoes and cucumber and lettuce. And in the winter, we grew the uh, the Caribbean crops: the uh, callaloo and pigeon pea and um, long beans and um, uh, all those uh, Asian and uh, Caribbean crops. So we always had a ton of food, to, you know, uh, all, all year round. And we opened up to a lot of things. We had education. We had, you know, activities. It was just a matter of maintaining buyers. You know, as we started, we had uh, a full CSA. And after the first three months, uh, it dwindled off very quickly. Uh, convenience, you know, access, uh, all those things here in South Florida yeah. are factors. So even having a, a, a you know grocery stores were right nearby us. Uh, the one that was buying from us went out of business. It was Toonies, a small little you know company that did some organic food. Uh, this was our biggest um, issue. What really why we shut down? Yeah, thanks for that, Michael. Um, you know what I'm sharing on the screen right now is we what, what you're. Um, what you're bringing up is not unique. We see that uh, a lot, especially amongst um, entrepreneurs who do have a knack for growing um, and are really, you know, they love the actual farming aspect. Um, but there's a lot of, of, you know, it's really hard for one individual to have both the, um, the to have the, the business mindset that you need, right? Um, to have the farming skill set and to be able to market and sell. Um, so, I don't you know, mean to cut you off, but I, but I do want to say this, that I yeah. came from an architectural business of 24 years. I was very connected in the community. I uh, had done a lot of community-based projects, been involved in a lot of, a lot of boards, and, uh, you know, new restaurant owners and um, designed restaurants and uh, all these, you know, as had marketed my architectural practice, so I knew a bit how to connect with uh, people in the industry. We started growing Broward, which was a local food cooperative to try to, you know, provide some of that education and, and advance for the other food entrepreneurs in the community because they didn't seem to have the true entrepreneurial skills. And we thought if we found them together, we could attract uh, the types of um, commercial services that we needed. But again, it, it was, uh, you know, banding everyone together was an issue. You're right. Going at it alone is a challenge. Uh, it, 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 these were the things we tried. Uh, and, I'm, and to me, the solution to the others would be to find buyers. You know, if there was someone yeah. who would come to the farmer's market at the end of the day and buy everything that was left over, we'd have the confidence to go and set up and crop a lot of food and be there. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, so... Um well, the, the reason I was bringing that up before is, you know, we, we do deal mainly with, you know, new farmers, right, that are just starting out. So there, there's a range of challenges there. Um, but but the reason I was bringing that up is because usually they forget about the the marketing and the sales aspect. Um, that's the if, if there's one thing that they sort of don't invest enough time into, it's that. So I just say that to, I know your situation is a little different, it sounds like, since you, you've been in the community a while. And um but it's 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 not unique. It's definitely the biggest challenge we see. And you know the the we, we see a lot of people that get excited about technology, right? And they they spend all their time focused on how do they you know create the best operation, and then they're left with you know all this food without the the strategy for how to sell it. And it's it is really challenging. Um, what I was showing here is just we have a commercial urban farming course that we're now offering online through our agriculture designer platform. And we dedicate a whole lesson that our lead agronomist, David Caesar, who's also run some urban farms in the in the San Francisco area um, uh, that he leads, really focused on on this topic and focused on how do you choose the right um, sales channel. Some of it, you know, I guess just to, to give a couple points, some of it is related to scale, for example. Right. So 
Um, we do see some people make the mistake of they they ch they're chasing maybe supermarket contracts when they're never going to have the scale uh, at least early on. Um, they're not going to have the scale to hit the the quantity demands, um, or they're going to need to. Um, you know, the supermarket will have oftentimes certain certifications that, that the farm is going to need some time to, to get, um, uh, you know, get GAP and, and, um, uh, and other certifications that are important to that, that supermarket or just a long like due diligence process. Um, so, so, yeah, those are definitely some challenges that we see um, scale. But then, you know, a lot of it is also just figuring out it's, it's taking a similar approach of, um, you know, what we even did when we built this platform with Agritexture Designer is, you know, we first started with who is our user and how are they going to use this product best. Um, and so especially if you're selling at a direct to consumer level, um, it's really trying to figure out what are the little hacks um, that you can use from a, a marketing standpoint where you're you're creating that direct connection um, with that customer to make sure that, um, you know, anytime they have a, you know, they might have a question, for example, on, you know, I've never seen this, this, uh, product before. I don't know what to cook this with. Um, and so that might be a reason that they don't sign up for the CSA box the next time is they're just, there's a lack of education there, even if they have the desire, um, to do the right thing from like an ethical standpoint, um, they might not have all of the, um, the, the kind of tools, you know, to in the kitchen or, or, or whatever, wherever else to um, to actually like execute on that box. So so those are a couple of things. But, yeah, I would say, you know, David in particular is definitely more of an expert on this subject. And, and this lesson is great overall um, for just kind of understanding how do you line up uh, what you're doing on the agriculture side with finding the right outlet to, to sell. OK. Very, very good, uh, Ricky. Thanks. Let's go on to another question. Kendra, do you have one coming up for us? Um, we do have uh, two. Well, one was more of a comment. Um, Sarah would like to know a little bit more about the small scale urban farmers. Um, and then we do have another question after that. OK, let's go with uh, have Ricky respond to the small scale urban farmer, then we'll pick up the question. Yeah, so here, um, I know I kind of breezed through this, like, th I think there's a lot of um, a lot of benefits that small scale urban farming can provide. The reason that I see and, and you know, if you still look at over the last few decades, certainly in, in a city like New York, where, um, you know, you couldn't even you weren't even allowed to, to basically start a community garden until the 70s. Um, so you had kind of guerrilla gardeners before that. And people kind of taking back, you know, vacant lots. But you know, we went from from at least zero uh, legal gardens to now nearly 600 certified um, community gardens in the city in 40 years. So you're seeing, I mean, at a high level, like good trends, I think, happening. But there's still there's a lot that can be done from a policy standpoint because even as those numbers might go up you still see all the time uh, gardens get sold off back to the city uh, or back to, to developers for a dollar here in New York um, so that they can develop on that land, um, right? And you see issues of like, of gentrification kind of um, occurring after, you know, a, a new garden starts up and the property values increase around that area. So there's, it can be a bit of a double-edged sword. And so you, you really need to have protections in place so that um, the garden can truly serve as like a, a, a community um, center. And it, it, it's just hard in the urban environment. Um, you know, the cities that I would see that I'm, I see are leading the charge just from a, the, the, the major cities, I guess I should say, that are leading the charge from a policy standpoint. Atlanta, I mentioned before, um, they hired the first director of urban agriculture um, to sit within the mayor's office in 2015, Mario Cambardella. Um, and he he created a ton of terrific programs. And and really what he was, was he was the glue. He was bringing and he was he was adding the legitimacy um, that I think a lot of these more grassroots organizations needed, um, you know, someone just to advocate for them um, at the at the municipal level. Um, and it, it definitely made a big difference there. Um, 
Uh, the other two cities, by the way, that have recently hired urban ag directors are Philadelphia and DC. So it's a trend that we're hoping continues. Um, uh, I think Atlanta is oftentimes used as the example there, and it seemed to, to have gone over quite well there. The other example I want to point out is like the agrihood example. So this more applies to, it's oftentimes used in, in a more suburban context, um, right? Where if you're creating a new, a new development of houses, rather than centering it around uh, you know, a pool um, or a golf course, um, you center it around a farm. And there's a lot of different examples um, that we've seen there where, you know, the property management company might actually employ a farmer themselves. And, um, you know, the ability to sign up for a, a discounted CSA comes with, um, uh, you know, as part of like managed by a homeowners association, or, you know, you, you, you unlock the access by becoming a, um, a property owner in that community. The Urban Land Institute, by the way, did a great study a couple years ago on agrihoods. They found, I think, close to 200 agrihoods around the U.S. If you want to read that report, um, but I think that's a, a really good example. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm all ears on on you know, you guys are the policy council, so I want I want to learn from you guys as to what um, uh, other examples of how cities can continue to advocating uh, for this because yeah, the major challenge here is just. From a commercial standpoint, you can't, you know, obviously community gardens, that's not really the the, the way they're going about this, but even like small scale urban farms um, that try to, to create a viable business, um, they just create, they, they just, um, I see, I've seen by and large, just really, really major challenges, um, even if they have an advantage, like, uh, you know, they have free access to the land for a certain amount of time you know, that time eventually runs out, they've invested, you know, everything they, that they've invested into the soil health, and now they have to move, you know, so even if it's like, oh, well, what's the big deal, just move a couple blocks down the street. Um, that's oftentimes the way that the kind of the city thinks about it. And, and obviously, that's not the way that a farmer thinks about it. So um, yeah, anyways, I'm, op I'm, I'm open ears on on uh, policy initiatives on that front. Ricky, let me weigh in on that, uh, from the policy perspective. And uh, the challenges that you bring up are um, are right on the mark. Uh, I, I recognize too the rise of agrihoods as kind of a model for developments, but they tend to be uh, upscale and they tend to favor uh, the well-to-do and the wealthy that already have access to plenty of good food and can get food just about anywhere anytime they want. So the agrihood just kind of piles on with an additional amenity for them. It'd be wonderful to see agrihoods uh, established in um, redevelopment parts of communities or yeah. parts of the community that are underserved, but that might be a bridge too far right now. Um, I think that from a policy perspective, the idea of having a farm director or an urban farm director on the city payroll or on a municipal or a county payroll goes a long way to helping to organize farm activities especially small scale activities. We devote a tremendous amount of energy to all sorts of uh, urban renewal or urban revitalization projects. And very often food production is the very last thing that we think about. So to prioritize food production in terms of the urban environment and improving the urban environment, I think is the first policy step that could be taken by municipalities and by counties. And yet, because we tend not to think of food in the urban environment, that often is very difficult for urban planners, for municipal governments, for city managers to get a hold of. And yet there are cities that are doing it, as you mentioned, uh, Atlanta, you said we're aware of that. Philadelphia, I think, is doing it as well. And even on a smaller scale, some of the cities in Florida, I, I know, are doing it. There's much more to say about this, and you and I and others on the policy council, we may be able to visit about that. Uh, but I want to go on to other questions. Kendra, we have another question coming up, I think. Yes, we have one from Ruel with the current pandemic and the realization of doing urban farming. Is there a future in venturing to commercial CEA? People could simply rely on backyard production rather than buying in the market and also new technologies increase CapEx translated to added cost of production, hence more expensive produce. Yeah, OK, so kind of a multi-layer question there. Um, Okay, so the first one on on yeah the COVID nineteen impact. Um, let's see. 
I, this is, you're seeing trends right now for sure. Uh, we're seeing trends that would um, demonstrate that people are definitely in, more interested in homesteading um, and having, yeah, whether it's a small hydroponic system or if they have outdoor space, um, you know, a, a small garden, there's definitely interest there. I, I, I tend to be skeptical. Um, I, I think that it's, it, it can be a culture thing. It can be, um, you know, oftentimes it is, it's a, it's a space thing, right? We, if, if there was a, um, if you thought of your garden as you think of, of maybe a, a kitchen appliance, right? At least, especially in the, in the hydroponics world. Um, and there are some companies that are trying to do that, that are, that are making sort of kitchen like appliances and, and selling more to real estate developers. Um, and, and there's some interesting, um, examples there, but I think there has to be more of a cultural shift, at least here in the U S, um, where that is a, is a more acceptable um, thing, right? And it's not something that you seek out, right? You can seek it out, and you know, I could move from my little apartment here in Brooklyn, where I have I have no access to the outdoors. Um, I could specifically prioritize. You know what? I'm going to have a garden no matter what in my next apartment. But I would be, you know, there'd be a major trade off that I'd be paying, um, right? I'd be probably, you know, working on top of my girlfriend right now. Um, so. So yeah, that's just a note on the on the homesteading piece. And then your point on the CEA on the capex front, um, which I noted, he yeah, has a challenge here, but I didn't really have time to get into. Um, you know, that's where, let's see. Yes, um, right now a lot of products that are that are coming out of controlled environment farms are at higher price points. I think that's more a state of, because of the state of the industry being very immature. Um, you're seeing uh, you're seeing capex costs and especially operating costs come down um, because of these opportunities here. And so as that happens, and as these as these farms prove that they can um, really hit the the scale that they would need to sell into um, you know local grocery stores, for example, you are seeing some examples of kind of price parity with other like local or organic um, products. So, I'm I'm still optimistic that, um, and I know I, I definitely know that you know by and large the entrepreneurs do not want to create you know they don't want to sell to uh, Michelin star restaurants for the most part and just stay stay with that um, market. They they really want to make sure that their products are getting to. Um, uh, oh, I'm gonna give back control to someone here. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, uh, that's, uh, I guess that's what I'll say on that front. Okay, very good. Uh, Kendra and Ricky, I think we have time for one more question. So if we have one in the queue, uh, Kendra, would you bring that forward? Yes, we have actually two real quick questions. Um, for those of you who were on today that weren't not able to ask a question, please email us at info at flfpc.org. We'll make sure to connect you with Ricky. Um, we do want to continue this conversation. Uh, so just real quick, can we certify hydroponically grown products organic? This is one question. And the other one is, is aeroponic a better way to farm than hydroponics? Okay, yeah, good questions. I'll try to be concise here. So um, the answer is on the aeroponic front, it definitely depends. Um, aeroponics can have advantages versus hydroponics. Um, uh, less water use, for example, um, you know, just the difference for those that don't know is you're, you're kind of misting um, your, your nutrient solution onto the, the root zone versus providing either a steady flow of water or having them sit in a body of water, like a deep water culture hydroponic system. Um, but there's, there's some drawbacks as well. Um, by the way, there are some some uh, producers that point out increases in yield um, with that solution. But um, one of the big challenges is you often see sprayers get clogged, um, especially if you're using uh, mineral nutrients um, as they start um, uh, becoming uh, less soluble. Um, they can clog the, the little nozzles of the sprayers and that can kind of shut down your entire um, operation. So it's a, a bit of a maintenance nightmare for, for um, or it has been for some um, aeroponic producers. Um, 
can we certify hydroponically grown products organic? Great question. So uh, this is worth looking into if you, if you really want to do this. The answer right now is yes, but there are currently lawsuits out there that are trying to shift that to no. Um, it's a big battle that, that's happening right now in the US. In the EU, you cannot currently. Um, so some of it just depends geographically. Um, and um, and yeah, but uh, as of right now, for hydroponic and aquaponic, you can be certified organic. Interestingly enough, right now for aeroponic, um, the recommendation, at least from the organic uh, uh, certifying board, is that you you uh, would not be able to certify aeroponics organically. Why that is versus hydroponics, it beats me. But um, Ricky, thank you so much. Uh, what uh, our response has shown me and what your presentation has taught me is that we're going to benefit from having you back again. And uh, we're, Kendra or I or both of us will get with you in the near future and we're going to schedule something uh, for another forum or perhaps maybe one of our special, uh, special topics forums. Uh, just because of the sheer volume of interest. And I know that we have a backlog of questions and I didn't even get to ask my questions, <laughs> which I had all lined up because uh, I study uh, the impact of, um, uh, of technology on uh, the sacredness of our culture and the things that we sacralize and hold significant. But that's another story and another time. Uh, that being said, uh, we want to thank you, Ricky. We all applaud your work. I don't know if anybody else is clapping, but I am. So thank you so much for that. I want to uh, also now turn it over briefly to Kendra and ask Kendra to give us a short preview of what's coming in July. We have two special events, or we have one special event and one regular forum. So Kendra, if you could take just a minute on that and tell us a little bit about what's coming up on the 17th and then at the end of the month. So on July 17th, we're going to be holding a special edition of our forum. We're going to feature three panelists and our topic is going to be food insecurity and food justice. So that'll be a great um, event, a great conversation. And then at the end of the month, uh, we're going to be doing a normal forum um, like today on land use policy. So please check us out. Go to our website. We'll have information up. Uh, very soon, hopefully this weekend, on our Facebook page and on our website. Yes, thank you, uh, Kendra. And I think what folks are seeing, those that are still with us, is how our events are kind of like uh, a ripple, that one ripples into the other, ripples into the other, ripples into the other. So everything that Ricky was talking about today, so many aspects of it are going to show up in the food insecurity element and food justice elements. They're also going to show up when it comes to the study of land use, and discussion of land use relative to agriculture. So the Florida Food Forum is really not just a once a month event, but it's really an integrated, ongoing series of conversations that relate to one another and have bridges between one another and with the food system as a whole and with our lives. So we thank everyone for being part of it. Special thanks to Ricky, our guest for today. We do want to encourage everyone to please consider joining the Florida Food Policy Council. It does make a difference. We are a not-for-profit organization, and we are supported entirely by the funding that comes from our members and folks that share gifts. A not-for-profit organization, of course, allows for uh, tax deduction of contributions. We don't want to pitch that too strongly, but it is important to the Florida Food Policy Council going forward and being able to offer programs like the Florida Food Forum. So thank you, Ricky. Thank you, everyone that has joined us today. And please join us again in the uh, uh, coming month and the months ahead. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Kendra. And thank you all. My best. And thank you again. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, everyone.